Good morning, everybody. Um, I've had an opportunity to be a citizen science teacher for a number of years, uh, working in the Dublin, uh, Durham County school systems. And so when I was putting this together, I was coming at it from that perspective in terms of technology. How many of you actually teach science, math? Okay, good, because this is geared towards you. I'm trying to give you some take-home ideas that you can go there and actually use in the classroom um, that you can run with because the one thing that I've learned in my, uh, I've taught quite a bit in a lot of different type of settings, including the university settings, is that the more you can keep people active, the more you can engage them in the activity and actually get them to buy in. And so what I'm going to be trying to provide for you is some ideas that you can readily use. Everybody wants their own data. You heard that term, big data, and it's true. It's a blessing and a curse because once you collect big data by God, then you've got to figure out a way to go there and analyze it. And it's not cheap and it's not easy, but that's where we all want to be. People want to collect their own data. They want to understand what's happening. I tell people all the time as a, as a research scientist, the air that this young lady is breathing is different than the man in the, the purple shirt. Guarantee you they're breathing different air. They can live in the same house. They can be breathing different air. People want to know how they're being exposed. Time activity, where you spend your time and what you're doing affects your exposure. And we understand that. And people want to know about it because they're interested in their own well-being. One of the things that we've done, and I encourage you to go to this website, because almost everything I'm talking about today, we're building for you at EPA, and it's the Citizen Science Toolbox. It has a host of materials including the sensor user guidebook. I've published almost 200 peer review papers, which is a lot for, for a lot of scientists. This particular guidebook has been downloaded over 100,000 times internationally and nationally. It's just flown off the shelves. People are interested in how to use sensors, what do they need to understand about sensors, if they're going to buy a sensor, what do they need to look for, what are the questions to be asked, and this is a tool designed for you. It's written at the 12th grade level specifically so that students and others can read it and understand it so that before they go and jump into a project they understand what pollutants are interesting what pollutants might they be interested in monitoring and what they need to understand about that i'm going to be giving you some ideas about some of the technologies i have to use this disclaimer we can't recommend any of these um, because we just can as a federal agency but i wanted to give you a taste of what are some of the things that are on the market of course, there are the cell phone apps, and there are a lot of those that are out there now that provide you the ability to go there and access environmental data or even collect environmental data. There are also the small microcomputers, the Arduinos or the Strawberry Pies. We're using a lot of those in our small technologies. I'm building sensor kits that citizens are using all over the U.S. Some of these only cost a couple hundred dollars. Some may cost a thousand dollars or more but we often are using microcomputers to run the programs to review data do that first pass of data quality assurance to go there and store data and these we've discovered that students love programming these small arduinos it gives them hands-on capabilities and it's very inexpensive it doesn't take too much to do that also you see the communication the zigbee we're doing a lot of things where we're putting multiple small environmental stations, some literally the size of oh, a brick, for lack of a better phrase. We're actually using small sensor packages like that spread out over large areas and then using small um, little communication pods like that Zigbee right there to daisy chain them so one will speak to another which will speak to another and actually saturate an area with communication technology so we can understand what's happening in place to place. And there are a lot of crowdsourcing um, materials that are available. You might see the air quality egg. That's one of many where mostly creative people, um, rather more so than technology people, have decided to go there and jump into the environmental monitoring aspect because they have design specialists. That's not a bad thing. It's just that you always want to make sure you have good engineering along with design when you're trying to go there and collect data. Here's some examples of things that are available too. If this is a, 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 a product out of France, it's the Sinceris um, line. It uses a smartphone. That device over to the far left is the actual monitoring. It's about three inches by a half inch by about two inches. Weighs about four ounces. 
sells for just a couple hundred dollars. It collects data in real time, which is then um, sent to a web service via cell phone. It goes to the web service. It then comes back to your cell phone. So in real time, you can take measurements, look at it as you're walking around a city, and store the data in an archive. And there are many such examples like that. This particular one looks at temperature and carbon monoxide and particulate matter and noise level. And that's just one of many examples. And people love to graphically look at their data. There's goods and bads about that. But people love to do it, so why not give it to them? Um, especially if it means your data processing time is, is shortened. If your ultimate goal is, in my neighborhood, different than this neighborhood in terms of a research curriculum, give it to them in a graphic. Let them do it automatically. There's also the opportunity for your students to build their actual sensors. I really encourage you to do that. I mean, get out the soldering iron, take the circuits. These are very, very simple devices made by air casting. That's a friend of mine and a colleague, uh, Michael Heimbinder, uh, who's done a lot of work in the New York, New Jersey area, assembling these small kits which are adaptable. Maybe your student wants to look at particulate matter, the dust in the air, or carbon monoxide, or maybe they want to look at um, some other pollutant. You can actually buy the sensor as a class, put it together, and use it. And this device will operate for about a year before the sensor will go bad. You're looking at a couple hundred dollars investment. And it has built-in Wi-Fi, and your data streams immediately to a, an app for, for viewing. Or you could go a little bit more high-tech. This is another company out of France um, that looks at multiple devices, multiple pollutants, in this case, uh, volatile organic compounds, um, like the benzene there. Uh, a lot of people are interested in the organics. Um, it measures in real time. It runs for multiple days without any change in battery. You literally just have to take that red toggle out of the device and it starts collecting data. How much more simple can it be? Those are the types of things that are available. Another thing that I want you to think about is why not get your class involved in, I probably get five to ten calls from citizens every week saying, um, Ron, I want to go there and do a measurement. I don't have any resources. And in the agency, we just don't give money away. But we do provide for grants and other opportunities. And many of these are geared toward high schools and other types of educational programs. On that toolbox website, I actually have a, um, a student who's working with me, and every month we update all of the available funding sources that we can find geared towards you. So maybe your students would like to go to that website and see if there's a $1,000 grant or a $10,000 grant that's geared toward them by both private and public and other entities that are available to you. We're making it available to you so that you can get some of these funding opportunities. Again, you can go there and build your own apps. You could go there and actually partner with some of the groups that are doing this, like public labs, where they're actually providing small sensor kits that can be used, both air and water. It's just a matter of choosing one, obtaining it, working with that. If you want to go, um, again, kind of low cost, you can do things like the SPEC. This is a device made out of Carnegie Mellon. They're creative laboratories. It's for $100. It measures the dust in the air. I won't say that it measures as well as what the state of North Carolina measures when um, they use their regulatory monitoring. It doesn't. It can't. But that being said, you can still use this device to go there in what I call at least um, it is an indicative monitor. It can tell you whether there's differences in the kitchen as compared to out in the parking lot. Is there a difference there? You may not have the exact number of what the particles in the air are, but you can use it to build a classroom curriculum. And there are other devices like the Dilos and also water turbidity meters. Not too expensive. You don't have to collect your own data. You can actually use data that we're making available to you. You may be familiar with the Village Green. Google that. It's one of the most successful programs we've done in the agency. In fact, we're putting out, we've got a station outside of a library here in Durham County. It's about five miles away from this location. It's the first real-time air quality monitor where data is provided to the citizens ever by a federal government agency. Myself and Gail Hagler put them out about a year and a half ago. We now are installing these in multiple cities. You can go to this website and pull data in real time, graph it, look at it. We put all those things there for you. Your students can understand. What are the differences in ozone concentration in the summer versus the winter? How much does it change day versus night? What is the influence of rain and other factors on that? The data is there. You don't have to collect data. It even does all the graphing and stuff. 
you actually have assets available to you all the time, free of charge, where your students can go there and acquire data, look at it, and make scientific hypotheses. And so that's some suggestions for you. And so I'm going to stop. That's all that I have. I want to take some time and ask and see if there's any questions. Again, you can collect data fairly low cost, fairly inexpensively. You can use data assets that are already available to you. You have the toolbox that is a great resource guide that gives a lot of ideas. Questions? Yeah. Oh, yeah. There are many, many such products like that. It is a great price. Um, water is much more expensive to monitor than air. Nobody's ever told you that. It's the truth because water is not a happy medium. <laughs> I mean, things happen in water. And fresh water is easier to do than salt water. You get into brackish water, salt water. A device like this may last a month. I don't know, it wouldn't even last a month. It may last a couple of weeks because of just the corrosion and other things that are going on and the bioaquatic life that likes to build up on things dipping in water. But for freshwater measurements, ponds, rivers, streams, it's a great class project. Good question. Others? Sir? Yeah. It gives the student um, an idea of what, what might they measure in the air. It gives them a list of pollutants and what those pollutants typically, what type of concentrations we typically find in the air and the things that typically influence those concentrations. For instance, nitrogen dioxide. You're breathing nitrogen dioxide right now. It's part of your just living. Well, you also find that around highways. You also find that when you have uh, combustion products like maybe gas stoves and other types of things. And so that guidebook gives you an idea if one wants to understand and map their area of how they're being exposed, it gives you ideas about sources and what the concentrations typically are. So it gives them something to compare to. 